Welcome to Negro Leaguers in Puerto Rico. This is a special episode on Pancho Coimbre with Raul Ramos. Welcome, everyone. So tonight, I'm very excited. We are joined by, of course, as always, Jorge Colón Delgado. Hello, hello, uh, Jorge. Hi, Adam. Hi. And we're also joined by Raul Ramos. And you are the biographer for Francisco Pancho Coimbre. I'm very excited to learn more about uh, Pancho this evening. Welcome, Raul. Well, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Jorge, for the invitation. Uh, it's it's an honor to be here talking to you and, and to Jorge about one of those obscures baseball stars, baseball legends that unfortunately, because of a language barrier, I would say, and because uh, there was no one pushing for his name out there when uh, Buck Leonard and some others were uh, giving all these tales about some great players, they they miss him, right? So, but I'm, I'm very happy and very excited to be here with you guys. Excellent. I have so many questions uh, about uh, Pancho, but first and foremost is, uh, can you tell us about yourself and your background and, and uh, yeah, the interest in Pancho, where that came from? Yeah, so um, so I like to say that I'm Cuban with, uh, I, I was born in Puerto Rico with Cuban parts. My parents are Cubans, but I was born in Puerto Rico. And because of my dad, I, that's where it comes my love uh, for baseball. Uh, when I was uh, a kid, I went to Pancho used to have a baseball academy, probably the first baseball school. Well, it was the, the first baseball, baseball school in Puerto Rico. Um, and I went there in 1990. He already had passed, right? So I was there, and the, the teachers, the instructors were Juan Gilbe, who played in the Negro Leagues with the Cubans and the Clowns, um, Fe, uh, Felix Gilbe, his brother, who played in the, in the Negro Leagues uh, with Baltimore, uh, and some other players, uh, Bienvenido Rodriguez, who played with the uh, uh, Chicago. Chicago, yeah, with Chicago, and, and some others. And these guys, they when when they used to talk about Pancho, their eyes will glow. Uh, they had this light, and uh, and I remember uh, Felix saying, "Oh, we 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 played the Yankees and we won." What? <laughs> I had no idea that Ponce had play the Yankees in 1947 at that time. So, and so anyway, so because of that is when, when my love for the game and for the, my respect for the Negro League started. And so right now I'm, I'm a baseball writer uh, for Con Base Llenas and Baseball Ahora. I'm a BBWA member. Uh, I have my uh, podcast, which Jorge is part of it, Mondays and Thursdays, uh, 8.30 p.m., and it's going to be now three years that we started this project. And uh, it, it's it's pure baseball, uh, interviews, analysis. So if, if, if you're able to improve your Spanish, <laughs> you'll be hooked. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that, that's the thing that always holds me back. But uh, little by little, we'll get there. Yeah, but you, you're, doing, you're doing good, Adam. So you're going to get there, yeah, more sooner than later. And that program that we have, I have with uh, Raul every week is Monday and Thursday. And as he said, we talk about baseball analysis, uh, Negro League history, the present, the past, the future. So it's, it's unique, you know, because we have six analysts and we try to do something different that what is being done right now, every other program. So uh, we three years now in March. So. We're very happy with that. And from what I learned in that program that I did, I prepared this one, Negro Leagues in Puerto Rico. So oh, it was, it, this that uh, baseball ahora is being a school for me. And uh, I appreciate Raul giving me the chance and I will be grateful for that. Well, I can certainly relate to that because when I first started uh, doing these uh, specials with you, Jorge, I knew very little about baseball in Puerto Rico. But just hearing these stories uh, has made me so interested in learning more. And, and that brings us to Pancho. And can you tell us, Raul, 
what is so special about Pancho Coimbre and uh, what led you to write a book about him? Well, um, so I guess being there with those uh, baseball legends that were serving as instructors, uh, that made me want to know more, not only about Pancho, but about the rest of the Negro League players that play in Puerto Rico or the players that play in Puerto Rico that play in the Negro Leagues, right? Mm -hmm. So I remember getting a few books, like, like everybody has the encyclopedia, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and from there, I read checking is like, oh my god, oh so and so and so and so. So like, so yeah. I remember, I remember with uh, I don't know, like I, trying to get that book, and at that time I was expensive, and, and anyway, but that's a different story. But um, so, so Pancho is is it's uh, a legend in Puerto Rico and Latin, Latin America, and for better or for worse, the same stories are were the ones that were told. Right, and I was like, there has to be, there has to be more about who was supposed to be the best player of Puerto Rico, the, the best Puerto Rican player of the of that era, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how I started like looking, trying to get into my notes, trying to find books, and um, and that's how this started. And and what I can tell you right now is like, um, Pancho, he played in in Puerto Rico in the professional league that started in 1938 but he played before that but he was uh older right when he started playing in the professional league if he was what 28 Jorge, right so yeah. so with 28 years he was 28 years old he was older but before mm -hmm. that he was he played in Dominican Republic he was part of the Trujillo team of the Dragons and he, and I think I told you that uh, we were we were having a discussion about like you didn't knew about it, like he was there, and then uh, he was being platoon, and he uh, he decided to leave because uh, he didn't go to the to the Dominican Republic to be on vacation, mm -hmm. so so he left right, um, and in Puerto Rico when Cincinnati went to uh, on a tour in 1936, he was part of that of that team that play uh, one of those teams that play Cincinnati. Uh, Martin Diego was uh, a part of the Cuban team that play also in, in that tournament. Uh, from Puerto Rico, there were some others. Uh, it, they, actually, the team Ponce was the one that, that played one of them. And uh, Perucho Cepeda was part of the team. Iran Bithorn, he was part of that uh, Ponce team, right? So anyway, so little by little, you start reading about something and you are able to find uh small links that you're able to put together and, and, and bring a story unfortunately pancho died in in 1989 so it's been a while and the majority of the people that saw him play they have already passed mm -hmm. so it was trying to find who's left right i decided to, this, to do this book a bit later <laughs> it was better uh but things happen when they need to happen right but like a lot of the people that that saw him play that were members uh they already passed so but I'm, I'm i'm very happy for with all the information i was able to get yeah i guess that was my next question you mentioned early on that he's a little bit more of an obscure legend i hate to use that word with with the talent level he had but mm -hmm. to the rest of the world at least he's a little bit more obscure so how difficult was it to find more information about him and stories about him um well so pancho coimbre was pancho coimbre he made his name right because he played in dominican republic he did very good. He was uh, part of the uh, of the Lycée team uh, before the Lidom, the Dominican uh, League, uh, became organized. Let's call it like that way, right? And in Venezuela, he played 1930s, uh, a couple a couple of years. So something that I wasn't aware, and Jorge knows, and you don't know, is that the uh, that Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican players. Uh, had a lot to do in Venezuela. They they helped promote the game. They made the Venezuela players better. So a lot of those of the Puerto Rican stars uh, that used to play in Dominican Republic or the star players in Puerto Rico, they went to Venezuela uh, to play and they stay. Some of them they even stay there. Uh, so so Pancho uh, he was he was there, but when when Pancho started playing baseball. 
he was not the hitter that we knew about. He was a pitcher. Mm. So he was he was he was uh, brought to Venezuela to be a pitcher. He was a star pitcher in for Ponce in Puerto Rico. But it seems like he blew his arm, and he was playing uh, when the days that he didn't pitch, he would play second base. And you know, before uh, there was a transition for second baseman that they will go to the right field. So in the Dominican Republic, he will pitch, but he will play more second base and he will play the outfield. But then I guess when later in his career, later, I mean, in like 1936, 1937, when he was 27, 28 years old, he went more to the right field in Puerto Rico. But in the Negro Leagues, he played uh, more left field. Sometimes he played center field. Mm -hmm. He even played uh, right field, but in the Negro Leagues, he played more left field. Can you uh, give us an idea of the type of player that he was, like in terms of like his size and his speed, arm strength, uh, his his skills and strengths at the plate, that type of thing? Well, it's it's been a bit difficult because some people are so in love on Pancho's memory that sometimes when they describe himself, they, they describe him, you're thinking that you're listening about Superman playing baseball in Puerto Rico. <laughs> and uh, But he was about 5'8", five, 5'9". Um, he had a very good speed. He used to be a sprinter uh, before he um, he play, he run track in Puerto Rico. Right. So uh, and there was a race of him and Miguel Navarro, both of them racing uh, doing track uh, because they were stars, right? So, um, but anyway, so so he was a very very fast runner. Uh, it seems he had a very decent arm because he was a pitcher, right? So he, he, he had a strong arm. And um, and his vision, that's what put him a part of the rest. Um, he used to say that he had an eagle an eagle eye, an eagle's eye. So that, that's that's why he it was so so difficult uh, for him to, to stroke out. Uh, but it, that's that's more of a legend in the sense like uh, I have learned that he used to be very agile in reading pictures. So he'll be able to know if a knuckle is what's coming or a, or a fastball or a curveball. So, uh, right. He told, he told a player, you told me that for the, the, yes. the movement of the arm. Yes. So, so Pancho, when he stopped playing, he became a coach, mm -hmm. a manager. He was a batting coach for the Puerto Rico national team for a few years. And so um, he had some of the best players so they were under him, right? So, and I actually had the opportunity to, sp to speak to uh, Junior Baez, who he's about 82 years old. He's in the Puerto Rican Baseball Amateur Hall of Fame. He's in the Puerto Rican Sports Hall of Fame. So he's like in his five, five holes. Um, and he was telling me that in 1966, when Puerto Rico played in the Central American Games, they won silver against Cuba. Pancho was the batting coach, and Jose Santiago, who also played in the Negro Leagues for the Cubans, mm -hmm. and with and he later on major league with Indians. He was the pitching coach. So just imagine having those two guys <laughs> as your as your coaches. <laughs> right. So, so I asked him, "Do you remember anything about what Pancho used to tell you?" He's like, "Actually, yes. Um, I remember that he was saying that it it, it was not." as important to look at the pitcher when he was doing his windup, it was the most important thing was to look at his arm. Because looking at his arm, you knew what type of uh, throw you were going to expect, you, you were going to receive. The Look at the angle. Uh, because that will help you to de decipher uh, the, the pitch that was coming. And in those games, after each at bat, he will sit down with the hitter and he will go over about like, do you understand that this is the pitch that he was going to throw you? Do you so this this movement that like uh, hold the, the way that he was holding uh, the ball or the glove? He was going to throw the curve instead of instead of something else. So he he was a uh, very good at reading pictures. That's great. Thanks for painting that picture of. Uh... <clears throat> the type of player he was. And, you know, another way we can tell the type of player he is, is statistically. And uh, 
thanks to the the Negro Leaguers in Puerto Rico uh, website, uh, I can pull up his stats and show that in 13 seasons, again, starting his career at age 28, 29, he was a 337 hitter. And one of my favorite things about Pancho is that in his Negro Leagues career, in four seasons, he also hit 337. So very consistent wherever he went. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what can you tell me about his performance in Puerto Rico? I would love to hear about this record of so few strikeouts as well, because these are the mind boggling numbers from, from Pancho. Yes. Um, so I, I was able to compile a list of the pitchers that struck him out in Puerto Rico. It's in the Spanish book that it, that was published in 2019. Hopefully, hopefully, uh, if all the stars online and the baseball gods allow me, the new ver the English version will come sometime this year. And uh, I can say that uh, he was a uh, so you have to remember something, right? And the the type of baseball that he played in Puerto Rico was similar to the Negro League style of play. Why? Why? Uh, a lot of the players that he had, that he that were part, uh, his partners, his friends, played in the Negro Leagues. His manager for Ponce, uh, which was very renowned, was, uh, he, he was a manager and played in the Negro Leagues. Uh, he, the, the, the pitchers uh, that he saw action against in Puerto Rico, the best in the Negro League, such a page, uh, Billy. Oh my God, Billy Bird, Billy Bird, Bird. Bird. Uh, Ipo uh, uh, Ray Barnhill, uh, even Leon Day, right? Yeah. So, so you have to keep that that, that in mind. He, his team, uh, the the Leones, the Lions in English. Oh, uh, I need to say hi to ATG. Those are those are those guys are great. <laughs> They do a lot of uh, design on on baseball games, so you know, a big fan. So anyway, so um, so he was a very smart player. Let's, let's start saying that. Uh, but at that time, like supposedly he could hit for power, but it was more of a oh, it's better if I put the ball here, but that's the runner, or he used to pull the ball a lot uh and his signature hit was a double down the third base line that uh to a few people uh people were afraid of him playing third base and there was a player that the ball was so hard that it caught him <laughs> uh at the time so so his, his bat speed was 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 unbelievable supposedly right and Something that made him different is like he used to. Uh, do you remember Kirby Pocket that he used to have a high leg kick, and let's say Ruben Sierra? So it seems what people are telling me, or people have told me, is that he was he had the high leg kick, but maybe more prof profusely than Pocket. Um, and the reason that I'm saying that is that when uh, I had the opportunity to to talk to Felix uh, Mantilla. Who was the first Puerto Rican to play with the Mets? Uh, he won a championship with the Braves, right? So Mantilla was uh, was in spring training in Miami, and at, the, at that time, Satchel Page uh, was there. He was part of the uh, Miami team, and Satchel asked him, "Are you Puerto Rican?" And Mantilla goes, "Yes," and then he go, and then Satchel goes. How is do how how is uh, how uh, the guy that lifts his leg? How is he doing? <laughs> Don't remember Pancho's name, and he goes, Pancho, because everybody in Puerto Rico knew that the guy that he will lift his leg to bat was Pancho Coimbre. Mm -hmm. So so Satchel asking ask uh, Mantilla about about Pancho, and and they had a lot of respect. Uh, but they had uh, respect, and it was a a war between them. The only like when you used to ask Pancho, "Oh, uh, do you remember who struck you out?" Oh, I, I don't remember. I don't remember. He he liked to talk about that. <laughs> but but there was an instance that someone asked him, "Is if if it's true that Paige struck you out once?" Uh, and he goes, "Yes." But the but 
the next the next time the next turn that I took, I hit it out of the ballpark. <laughs> And, I, and 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 like I, I look and actually I found that I found that that, the, that on that game that supposedly that he was struck out he actually a homer in that game so amazing and uh, just so people can understand like how hard it was to strike Pancho out in uh, in Puerto Rico in the seasons that we have strikeout data for he had one thousand seven hundred and fifty at bats and he struck out twenty times he went a three season stretch without striking out. Uh, and just unbelievable. Yes, and well, you know, you know something. Before we we continue talking about power, you know, home runs and all those uh, triples, we have to be fair with Pancho because uh, the dimensions of the, the park dimensions of that era mm -hmm. were very uh, big. You know, the first ball player to hit ten or more home runs in Puerto Rico was Josh Gibson. So imagine when you're talking about, let's say, Sixto Escobar Stadium, 365 in the lines, 425 center field, but with a, a line of trees before pine trees, as you have to, to hit a home run, you have to hit it over the pine trees. And uh, the, the, that happened too with uh, Charles H. Terry Park in Ponce. It was dimensions were very extensive. So uh, we, have, we have to, I have to say that, that, there was not too much, many home runs in that era of Pancho Coimbra in Puerto Rico, and not not and not only that. Uh, if people that know so know, like if you're going to try to hit it out, how many times are you going to do a play out, right? Mm -hmm. And Pancho, his philosophy was, and he that's why he used to tell the players when he was coaching or later on in his career, if you are a 300 hitter, you will always have a job somewhere. Mm -hmm. So he used to try to hit for for average always, uh, and like uh, there was a I don't know if you remember uh, Bimbo uh, Bombo Bombo Jesus Rivera Jesus Jesus Rivera uh, they they used to call him Bombo he played for Minnesota 1970s 80s uh, and he yeah Minnesota so I had a chance to talk to Bombo and. They knew each other. Bombo was also from Ponce, or it's from Ponce because he's alive. And Bombo asked him, "How are you able to to hit 400 uh, when you used to play?" And and Coimbra's answer was, "In order to hit 400, you you need to want to hit 500." Mm -hmm. And and that was Clemente's philosophy too. And I can see, and there, there's a line between Clemente and Coimbre. They used to respect each other, right? And Clemente told uh, Kenny Singleton that if if he wanted to hit 300, he needed to he needed to want to hit 330, 340. So that's so you can see the correlation of of the philosophy of hitting there you see clemente you see pancho uh, embracing clemente and big um big power yeah that's great you referenced this earlier but i we have the stats thanks to uh jorge site uh, of his professional seasons in puerto rico but can you tell me what he was doing before uh 1938 39 you mentioned that he was also playing in puerto rico but the league was in an amateur status at the time, if I understand it correctly, and he would also play in the Dominican and Venezuela. I don't want to call it amateur. I would like to call it um, not organized, right? Mm. And the reason that it was not organized, there were tournaments. It was not a league, but they would do tournaments. Mm -hmm. okay. And they pay the ball players. And they right. pay the ball players. Yes. Okay, so yeah. that's a better term, yeah. Yeah, yes. that's when that's when I told you uh, uh, when when Josh Gibson went with the Brooklyn Eagles and Estrella de Ramirez, right? That that type of tournament they held it in Puerto Rico in winter, and they pay ball players. You know, it's professional. Concordia went there, Almendares went to Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. Mexico Azteca from Dominican Republic. Uh, so they they pay them, they pay them, but we were not organized until 1938. Mm -hmm. when and when did he? Yeah, when did when did he rise to prominence? Then was it early, early in his career, or was it right around the time when the league went uh, 
organized and professional. Well, he, he was well known because when he was a pitcher and, and teams, New York League teams, or let's call them American teams, how they used to call them, used to mm -hmm. travel in the winter, right? They would select the best players. And he was one of the best players of the era, of, the, of, the, of that time. And he beat one of those American teams as a pitcher, right? Mm -hmm. So at the time, beating the Americans was a big thing, right? Because those are the the ones that are coming, the best players that are coming here. So, uh, and this Ponce team uh, used to be a powerhouse uh, because of the teams that used that the 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 players that used to come, uh, Dominican players used to come to play for that team. Sometimes that Ponce team used to go to Dominican Republic and have tournaments over there or exhibitions, right? So Coimbra was well known. Uh, I would say that when the professional league came, uh, being professional, that helped with his uh, legacy, right? Now, I have to say something. When the league started, he was not the best player. The best player the first three years was probably, well, not probably, was Perucho Cepeda. But then Perucho Cepeda took his hat off, and then Coimbre was the best player for, during that time, for in, in the 40s. And then after that, Luis Marquez, Cadena Marquez, mm -hmm. was the next great Puerto Rican player that was also success, successful in the Negro Leagues, right? So we, we have to be honest. So, so yes, I, I, but, but let's say that to the people that, that mm -hmm. Perucho was older than that. Yes. Perucho was yes. older. So the, next, that, the first season, 1938, Perucho was 32. Yes. So, so Perucho, uh, so he saw a lot more action. He saw action in Puerto Rico, but he was also he was always playing in Venezuela, playing Dominican Republic. He's part of that of that Trujillo team of the Dragons, right? Mm -hmm. So, so Perucho was one of the best players ever, um, and so that's what I'm saying. Like Coimbre was great, but before before Coimbre, I would say that. Uh, Perucho was the best, the first professional star in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, but Coimbre, he had the chance to go to the Negro Leagues. He was the best uh, yeah. Negro League player that, that we had. Because like, uh, Miguito, yes, Miguito played play, uh, in the Negro Leagues, but he was not a star in the Negro Leagues. He was a regular player. He was a very good player. Uh, and he was a, a star in Puerto Rico, right? But being honest, the the star used to be uh, Coimbra. Yes, the, the first well, the first Negro leaguer, Puerto Rican Negro leaguer star, was definitely Coimbra. And what happens is that um, uh, Perucho didn't play in the, in the states because of his, of his way of being. His, he was very temperamental, uh, temperament. Mm -hmm. And but he received three invitations for the Negro Leagues. One from Alex Pompez, one for from Clarence, Clarence Parm was the mm -hmm. other one, and and uh, and uh, Vic Harris, because they saw him in Puerto Rico and said you have to go to the Negro Leagues because he was <laughs> shortstop and batted fourth in the lineup. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, Perucho didn't have the opportunity, and and also Coimbre always played for Ponce. Mm -hmm. And any player that gives glory to Ponce, nobody's going to forget him. You know, Coimbra is uh, something big because besides of the what kind of player he was, he played for Ponce. Perucho Cepeda played for many teams, six teams. Mm -hmm. Ponce, Guayama, Guayama, Santulce, San Juan, mm -hmm. Mayagüez. And so nobody, nobody calls him, no, nobody recalls him. He, nobody owns him. No city owns him. Mm -hmm. But with mm -hmm. Coimbre, Ponce, I don't, I don't can think of a city who more historical than Ponce who, who cherish, cherish all their players as Ponce. So that helped to Coimbre, who was a great player, as you said at the beginning. You know, he every place he went, three hundred at least. And and let's not forget that. Ponce winning five championships in the 40s. Yeah, the 40s. That 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 helped with their legend, right? Yeah. And that that was the first team that beat the Yankees. Yeah. Uh, in in 
in Latin America, right? When the Yankees went to Puerto Rico, they went to Venezuela and so on. So that Ponce team was the best, the first one that, that beat them. When the Yankees went to Puerto Rico, they bet, they bet, uh, they won against everybody, but they lost first against Ponce and then uh, against the Puerto Rican stars, let's call them, right? The, the old stars that they selected. Um, so, but yeah, but like, uh, I'm sorry that I, that I side, sidetracked, but I just wanted to, to share that with you, Adam. Yeah, no, I, 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 okay. referring to Adam, uh, that team of Ponce that beat the Yankees was, but the manager was uh, George Scales. Yes. I was going to ask that. That was that was the run uh, of of uh, championships with Chubby Scales, correct? Yeah, yes. George Scales. And the pitcher, the pitcher, the winning pitcher was Raymond Brown. For the Yankees. Who was mm. coach. He was coach with Ponce. He was not active. Mm. But what happened is that they were in the final series and they stopped the series and scales he didn't want to use any of his staff pitching staff and he gave, gave the ball to raymond brown who was his coach and raymond brown defeated mm -hmm. the new york yankees that's another thing about raymond brown that we can talk we not we are not we're going to talk in the future but raymond brown, raymond brown was another of those big he's in the hall of fame and everybody knows raymond brown but what he did in puerto rico was amazing so mm -hmm. and pancho was part of that and uh pancho i think you know at the beginning when we began the interview people know pancho but there's something that has helped pancho first of all i think is the when december 16 2020 that the, those seven leagues needle leagues were mm -hmm. big leagues then uh, interest for that type of who play in those leagues and Pancho mm -hmm. played in those leagues and Pancho became an, a big leaguer in December 2020 and that uh you know his name got a uh, mm -hmm. small mention now mm -hmm. than before because mm -hmm. of that now Pancho not only is a Negro leaguer he is a big leaguer and what a big leaguer because he was a great one no I I think that uh he passed in a in a house fire in 1989 and just shortly after that in the early 90s is when this boom for the knowledge of the new York league started right mm -hmm. and um so unfortunately he missed that mm -hmm. and I, I like people were going to puerto rico to interview players uh Mijito was interviewed juan gilbert was interviewed along along many others but the 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 star pancho he was not no longer there right so that that was something that unfortunately like uh held back his his legend like his tales and mm -hmm. also not having a sponsor for example uh buck o'neill buck o'neill was a great storyteller yeah and buck o'neill told all these stories that he could remember but there was no sponsor for the Latino players. Yeah. Martin Diego, yeah, he was exalted in 1973, right? 70, no, 77? 77. 77, yeah. But when you see his number in the New Orleans, yeah, they were good. But because of the number he puts, he put it in Mexico. And because of his legend, he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. Let's let's be clear, right? Uh, he has he had all the tools. He's probably the best and most complete player of all time but people will start talking about Diego and that's it that was the end of it but there was Tetelo Vargas from Dominican Republic right there's Pancho there's not that many Hispanic players that excel in the Negro Leagues but you know why Adam because players used to say yeah I could make more money playing in Venezuela mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm going to be treated better so so or I could be or I could stay I could play in, in Dominican Republic, which Mexico. is Mexico. Where Mexico, and I'm going to be treated better, and I'm going to be making more money. So at that time, you don't care. You didn't care about uh, playing in the U.S. You care about having a job that will pay you well, and you could play the whole the, the whole year or, or 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 five months or six months. Right. So so unfortunately, right? Nice. Unfortunately, uh, for better or for worse. Pancho had only four seasons in the Negro Leagues, 
Uh, it's they wanted seven to be considered for the Hall of Fame. He doesn't have them, right? But his aura as a legend, he has it. He played all over. He played in in Canada. He hit over 300 in Canada. He pitched in Canada. He he helped the team win the championship in Canada. So you add that to the numbers he had in Mexico in 1945. He hit over 340 in Mexico. Uh, so when you put all this together, you, you can go, oh, crap. You know, he, he, he was an excellent player everywhere he went. Funny story. Um, supposedly, supposedly, right? Supposedly. Uh, he will always hit a couple hits, right? So they took him to drink the night before. Right? Where? To where? In, 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 in the States. In, okay. He was in the Cubans. Mm -hmm. they, they took him to drink. To see how he could, how well he could hit the ball the next day, right? <laughs> and and supposedly he had trouble walking to the plate, but he had to hit that day. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it, it, you know, it's it, it, those tales, right, that are able to to paint a picture of of, of greatness of of uh, of this of this player. Another story. Uh, he was notoriously known to be an excellent curveball hitter sometimes he would and and he had a great um uh, back control so the team the the owner so Ponce was playing in san juan right and he goes to the owner of san juan no he goes to the club of san juan he goes oh can i have a couple of baseballs uh there's a couple of fans here and i would like to sign them and give them to them and the club, he goes, oh, I'm so sorry, but the owner uh, gives me a strict order not to give balls away. He's the only person authorized to give away balls. You know what? Not a problem. Not a problem. But when I go when when I go into the game, look at me really well. Look at me really good. Don't forget about that. Yeah, okay. So he's going to hit. And and he turned around to the club and he goes. Count them. And then he started hitting both foul, foul balls. <laughs> he goes, one, <laughs> two. So he hit like four foul balls. <laughs> and he goes, this time, not giving me two balls, it, co it costs you four balls. <laughs> Next time that I ask you for a ball, it will cost you 10. <laughs> yeah, Adam and Raul, there's something important here. Uh, Raul said something about, you know, that uh, Pancho didn't have sponsor and uh, as other players had, you know. And that's true, but I think that as I have talked with you, Adam, that's what we have to work. Now we are the sponsors of that baseball. And if Raul uh, published that book in English, he's going to be a, a sponsor of Pancho Coimbra. So we, the Puerto Ricans, have to write in English, talk in English, maybe not as fluid as we wanted, but I know the people understand us, and we are the sponsors of Pancho. We are the sponsors of Canena Marquez, and we are going to be the sponsors of all those Negro Leaguers, Latino Negro Leaguers that were good, but not too much is known about them. So I wanted to say that. Yeah, right here on my screen, I have uh, some stats I've been compiling for a talk I'm going to be doing in June. And it's about these exact players that need these sponsors that they mm -hmm. didn't play in one place. And some of the, you know, Pancho is one of them uh, and Aprucho is another, but it's also Tatelo Vargas, who you mentioned, Ramon Bergania, Silvio Garcia, a lot of these players who played all over the world. Uh, and I'm really excited to, to dig into their careers some more and, and share them with the world. Yeah, so I, for I forgot something, Raul. You're going to be a sponsor, or is going to be a sponsor, but Alam is right now a sponsor. <laughs> because Alam continuously in Twitter is talking about Latinos, and he's very interested. So I, I am, well, on behalf of Raul and myself, thank you, Alam, for the great work you're doing, the great job you're doing uh, of all our ball players. You know, uh, I'm very uh, grateful for that. Very, very grateful for that, Alam. I'm very grateful for the time you're uh, taking to help me learn about them. So this is great. Okay. You, we, we sidebarred a lot. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead. We, we uh, went into a sidebar quite a while ago, and then we just 
went into story upon story about Perucha Cepeda. And I just want to clarify for, you know, some people might know this uh, who are watching, but when we say Perucha Cepeda, we mean the father of Orlando Cepeda. He was just an incredible player who never came to the Negro Leagues because, as Jorge said, his temperament, it, it just wasn't going to sit with him to deal with the racism that was in the U.S. And one of the questions that I wanted to ask was, uh, and it's kind of related to how uh, Pancho played in one city his whole career, and Perucho was kind of all over the place. What was their relationship like? Like whether you know, you know, whether it was a friendly relationship, or if they were rivals, or if they were pretty much well known as like the two best players at the time. Uh, I'm curious about what that dynamic was. So uh, I actually had the chance to uh, ask that question to Orlando, to Perucho's son. And Orlando said that they treated themselves as brothers. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, baseball players, they are fraternity, right? And the best players, uh, they identify themselves like, oh, you, you are a goat, you're the goat, or go, like they say in Puerto Rico or in Latin America, you are caballo, caballo, cab the translation of caballo is horse, right? So it's like, you are a stallion, right? Mm -hmm. So so they used to respect themselves. Uh, and actually, the the image that Jorge put before that- of I'm going to put it again. Team, I'm going to put yeah. it again so you can explain. Look, please, Adam. So if you see at the at the right, you can see Orlando oh. and Perucho right there. Yep, yep. You, you can see them. And and Pancho is where's Pancho? Where's Pancho? Here. Pancho is the the fourth from the right to the left in the back. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, mm -hmm. yes. so so that that was uh, Perucho's la last year playing ball, and Orlando told me that as you can see, he was usually during the games he was there in the dugout, and at that time Pancho wasn't playing that much, and Perucho just only had a few at bats. So when Scales or or the manager asked for, hey, uh, I, I need a pinch hitter, they would go, oh, you know what? It's your turn. Take You take it today. No, no, no. You take it. Or, OK, I'll take it. And then you take it the next. <laughs> so so that's the, the relationship that they had. And actually, and um, Orlando told me that when his dad passed, he remembered Pancho yes. and some of the other players getting a car. And, and traveling from Ponce to San Juan, yeah. which is only like in today's in today's the age, the NH is only about an hour and a half because of the highway. But before it used to be between the mountains. So, so it would take what three, four hours, Jorge, right? Easily. Easily. So first you needed to find a car, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you. So then after finding a car, so they went and they paid their respects. Yeah, they went to the to to, to Perucho's house house and uh Pancho, Pancho and Perucho play in Venezuela together. They were teammates in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. When Ponce played in Venezuela, they were teammates. Mm -hmm. And uh, before the 1938 uh, Puerto Rican Baseball, Professional Baseball League, they played together in several teams. So they were friends. They were friends, but they were different personalities. Mm -hmm. Pancho was very happy. Uh, Cepeda was not like Pancho. That, you know, that, that didn't benefit Perucho. But uh, they were they were they were good friends. They were good friends. And, and something that I want to say that I want to share with you and to with all the people that are listening to us, he was a great athlete, but he was a fabulous runner. You remember the uh, the famous uh, Austin Smith uh, jump, right? Mm -hmm. That he used to do while running from the dugout to the field. So Perucho, yes, Perucho used to do that while he was running the bases <laughs> <laughs> so so just imagine running from first to second and him jumping like that doing the start like Aussie Smith yeah. somersaults on the base paths I yeah. love it <laughs> yeah. yeah so anyway so you know it's uh I, I know this is uh the show about Pancho but it's, there's so much information that we need to share for people to know about how great these plays were that it's it's important to do it. I think it helps paint a picture of like knowing that Tubby Scales was his manager and and you know who his big rivals were, even though they were they were yeah. friends. Like what other players were uh teammates of of his on Ponce that people might be familiar with? 
Uh, well, he had so so that that was that was a uh, nineteen what nineteen forty eight nineteen forty nine huh? fifty. This one, he, he, this guy here, this the ball player is Buster Clarkson. Buster Clarkson. That you, Alan, you're interested in him. He's on my list as well. So Buster is which player on this? I I don't see he, your your mouse cursor. The, the kneeling, the first one in the in the first row, kneeling. That's what I thought. The, okay, good. Uh -huh. That was Scott. Yeah, that's Buster Clarkson with Ponce. That was a great team. Uh -huh. Thought that was Buster. Perfect. I love it. Yeah. Can't wait to do a show on Buster one day. But anyway, yeah. it's no, we're gonna, <laughs> it's we're, Yeah, time. we're going to do a, a show on Buster Clarkson because. You have a you have a lot of information of him, and mm -hmm. uh, I we, I have the information of Puerto Rico since the beginning. Mm -hmm. So we have to um, do a show of Buster Class. So so something that I want to share, like for you to understand how good of a hitter Pancho was. Mm -hmm. He had uh, for some time he had a record, a twenty two uh, consecutive consecutive game hitting streak in mm -hmm. Puerto Rico. You have to remember that they will only play during the weekend. So he had to be hot the whole time, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but for but for those 22 uh, games, he had hits against Satchel Page, Chad Brewer, Raymond Brown, <laughs> Billy Bird, uh, Leon Day, uh, Impo Barnhill. So now you can see Roy Parlo. So now you can see what type of hitter he was. That is, that's a. Wow, that list of pitchers that he <laughs> collected hits against during a hitting streak is just unbelievable. No, and the, and the, all those pitchers that Raul mentioned, you know that that time from 1938 to 1941 was very, very, uh, very competitive league, for the Puerto Rican league. All those guys mm -hmm. and all the ones that we have mentioned that we, one in the future we're going to do. But there were a lot of good pitchers in Puerto Rico in that era, in that in that mm -hmm. period, in that period. Yeah, yeah I was and actually, huh? oh, go ahead. No, and, and you know what? Like his life as a hitter was very interesting as a player, as an active player. He was uh, very interesting. I mean, oh, I, I want to say hi. There's so many people connected, but Moises Gomez Rijos, who was a uh, uh, an executive in Puerto Rico, he's connected in. Uh, he's he's also a, a historian that, that he knows a lot about baseball in Puerto Rico, even Pancho. But like uh, what I was going to to share is that uh, Pancho, his life as a as a professional player was very good, but his life after professional player, it was also very interesting. He was a manager. He was a coach. Um, he was a politician. Um, he was uh, hired to go to another countries to have to improve baseball, uh, and he was a scout. So when you see all this, his influence globally with baseball, it makes him meritorious to be in the baseball in the baseball Hall of Fame. When you add all this to his career as a player, no, it's it's like it makes you think. And Pancho is not the only one. There's some other players that are that have had that history. Uh, so, and, and let's be honest, Buck O'Neill, wonderful ambassador for baseball. His numbers in the Negro Leagues are not that great, but he was there for a long time. Now, his his influence in the game as an ambassador, it was making him worthy to be enriched, right? Because only God knows how many people he made fans of the game. Mm -hmm. yep. So if you're able to see that, you're able to see the importance of Pancho in Latin America being the same type of ambassador for the game. Yep. Yeah. Hey, Raul, do you have the now we are talking about those all those pictures, the the, the the group of pictures that struck out Pancho? So Alan and our listeners. Can uh, know them. I have them uh, here. Go ahead. No, you have no, them. Juan Santaella, <laughs> Luis Raúl Cabrera, Larú Velázquez, Esteban Espinosa, Rogelio Wiscovich, Dan Banghead, Francisco Sotre, Jose Pereira, and there's one with the asterisk, Satchel Page. And so mm -hmm. you can talk about Satchel Page. Talk us about Satchel Page and Pepe Wimber. So, so the reason that I put the asterisk is that I was able to confirm that uh, Page struggled Pancho in Puerto Rico, but that 
statistic wasn't counted. So that's why it has an asterisk. Mm. Uh, but uh, so as I told you that, that there was a uh, mutual respect uh, between each other. Uh, Pancho, he knew he was a, a star. He knew it. Uh, some people have told me that uh, we used to meet someone, uh, if shake someone's hand, he will go, eh, el inmortal Pancho Coimbre a sus órdenes. Meaning the immortal Pancho Coimbre, Coimbre uh, at your feet. At your orders. Right? Yours truly. Your orders. At your your truly. truly. Tro, tro, yeah, yours truly, the immortal Pancho Coimbre. Yeah. <laughs> so, he, so he knew, right? That 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 he was he, he was he was a uh, he was great. Uh, he used to uh, later later on in, his, in life, he will be in in Latin America in the cities. Usually, there's a park in the middle of the city, with the church and Capitol Hall, right? So you could see him in that park next to the bank. He used to sell lottery tickets. Uh, that, that was that used to be his business. So he will be there. He will be talking to to everybody. Uh, unfortunately, I never had the, the opportunity to meet him. But all the stories that, that you hear is like uh, uh, he uh, he was a, a baseball coach for a long time, and when he was uh, when the teams would come, he will uh, he he will see he will see them uh, hit and say, wait 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 wait, you don't know how to bunt? No no no. Let's start from the basics. Everybody needs to bunt. Anybody needs to learn how to bunt. And after everyone learned how to bunt, then he will go, let's now learn how to hit. So uh, it's, uh, again, Pancho was one of those uh, guys that uh, he was a star that everybody recognized him. After he retired, he did the Coimbra Stars. And they will travel in Puerto Rico. That's the thing. That's the problem. That what he did was what other players were doing in the States, but he was doing it at a microorganism, at a small scale in Puerto Rico, but not in the U.S. So uh, so he will go all weekends to different... Puerto Rico has 78 towns. That's an entity municipio. So he will go... So every weekend he was invited to a different town, and he will play... He stars against a team of that town, and everybody would. Lo- everybody was waiting for him to hit. He would usually take one or two at bats, or one at bat. Hit a double, get to second run, uh, jogging, pull his cap, and people will, will applaud. Right. So it's it's a uh, everybody recognized how 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 good how great he was, uh, but unfortunately, right, this that happened in Puerto Rico and not in the United States. You know, taking this, uh, seeing the, the book of uh, Raul Ramos, listen to this. In Puerto Rico, lifetime, 337. Dominican Republic, 333. Uh, Negro Leagues, 338. Venezuela was the, it was not so good, 212. Mexico, he led the league in batting, 345. I'm in sorry, Canada, he didn't. He didn't. Huh? He was like... He did it. He was top three or something like that, but still, 345 is unbelievable. <laughs> and Canada, 312 in Canada. And the 22 consecutive game that he added, the first pitcher in that street, Satchel Page, he had three and five, to, and five at bats. Then Chet Brewer. We have here Raymond Brown, Billy Bird, Raymond Brown again, Chet Brewer, Satchel Page again. Leon Day, Impo Barnhill, and Roy Power, Roy Partlow, among others. So that's that's tough pitching. You can make a case that every single one of those pitchers should be a Hall of Famer. Like if people don't know Bird, Partlow, and Barnhill, I recommend looking them up. Like you could make that case for each of them. They were exceptional pitchers. Yeah. You know, I, I wanted to say just to share a story, right? Another story because the. The romanticism about these players is about their stories. So Pancho, he was a uh, the coach for the team of 1966 team that won silver against the Cuban uh, against the Cuban team. So uh, I was told that one of those nights, the president of the Puerto Rican Federation, P- 
Pancho and someone other, they went out to dinner. And when they came back where the all the players and all the delegations were staying, uh, the guard that was in the entrance didn't want them to go in because there was a, a strict order that no one was able to go in after a certain time, right? And the the president of the Puerto Rican Federation, this happened in Puerto Rico, he goes, oh, I'm the president of the Basel Federation. We're late, but no, no, I'm so sorry. There's orders. And supposedly, Pancho, he will always sit in the front seat. And he goes, eh, my good friend, hi. Eh, do you think you can help us out? And the guard goes, Pancho Coimbre, yes, absolutely, yes, go in. <laughs> so so that's how, how well known he was known in Puerto Rico at the time. So. Yeah, he was. He, and, I and, think and, after Clemente, maybe after Roberto Clemente, we're talking about uh, in the 80s, because right now we have Roberto Alomar and, and, yeah. and, and Ivan Rodriguez and Carlos Beltran and Edgar Martinez. But until nine, the 1980s, I think uh, Coimbra was w very well known. But with all these things that are, have, are happening with the Negro Leagues since mm -hmm. 2020, he has lift you know he's, he has got a little bit up you see he bear, uh, a lift he got his name got a lift and people know no more because there are more pe uh persons scholars studying investigating what happened in the yeah. Caribbean. yeah i need to add that uh when so iran bithorn was the be the first puerto rican player to play major league baseball right when he uh went to play with uh with the cops but for the Puerto Rican population, right, that that live in the states, that live in New York, they a lot of them, yeah, they knew they, they have heard about Bithorn, but they were expecting for Bithorn to be the first Puerto Rican. Uh, and I, I found a manuscript that it was published that about the historian that he mentioned that he was expecting a Coimbre to be the first one. So that's how regarded how he was uh regarded as a player so just, just to just i just wanted to bring that so you could understand like what the actual population was thinking at, at about that, at that time and it, it's funny uh, two years after they do uh a celebration in puerto rico in one of these in one of in a game that Ponce was there and they the dedication was to iran bithorn and luis olmo because they were in the major leagues and there's a picture that day of olmo Bithorn, both of them playing uh, wearing suits and Coimbre wearing yeah. his Ponce flannel because he was a player there. Yeah, and Pancho has a, uh, a museum. There are two things about Pancho. The, 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 there's a prestigious award, the Pancho Coimbre Award. Mm -hmm. Everybody, Everyone wants to win that award. And mm -hmm. he has a museum. Museum Francisco Pancho Coimbre in Ponce it's the oh, sports wow. museum of the area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there is going to be headquarters of the baseball pro professional baseball of Puerto Rico Hall of Fame, or Puerto Rico Professional Baseball Hall of Fame that we have talked about. Adam, uh, that's, that's going to be we're going to be there. So that's nice. a great museum. They're rebuilding it, and uh, it, it keeps the history of of sports in Ponce. And Coimbra has a special place there. It's Emilio Navarro, too, and all those ball players, Tomas Quiñones, all those ball players that Negro leaders that play in the States, they're there, their name are kept there. And you know what? There's so much like we can we can have easily a couple of hours to talk about Coimbra. Because Coimbra, he was Puerto Rican, but because he played for the New York Cubans, a lot of people are, are and even the press at the time. He was. They thought yeah. he was Cuban. Yeah. Oh, the the Cuban slogger, Pancho Coimbre. And no, he was not Cuban. But someone that I was able to, I was told that uh, the owner, uh, Pompes, of the Cubans, he recommended Coimbre to tell people that he was Cuban. Is in 1940s. Check this out about discrimination, right? Uh, 1940s. Unfortunately, Puerto Rican had a bad rap in New York. So he said, you know what? You could tell they're Cuban. 
Uh, so, but no, but he would say that he was Puerto Rican. He was very proud to say that he was Puerto Rican. But just just to bring that something, and um, and one of the reasons that Coimbre didn't like to, like he will he will get to the states late to play ball, right? He was playing the winter in Ponce, so he'll get in shape. So he, because he didn't want to deal in the south with whatever was going on, he will wait till last second just to get to the states and go north. Yeah, I was gonna kind of ask about what his experience was like playing in the United States because that's the big thing that separates Pancho and Perucho is that Pancho did go to the states and succeeded there. Mm -hmm. And do you think that he experienced some of the? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's. It, it, Everybody did, right? Yeah. Uh, some information that I got was that uh, there was an exhibition game, uh, I guess, in the south. And some Puerto Ricans from the military went to see him. But those fellows, they were not allowed in a certain part of the, of the stadium because they were not white. And he didn't like that, right? So that, that's what, that's, that, that was actually one example that was told about Pancho's experiences but what people used to say oh that yeah the the racism and the way that people were treated were awful but unfortunately he passed in 1989 so i couldn't have a full recollection or an actual source telling me oh he encountered this or this happened to him mm -hmm. so but, but yeah but unfortunately all of they did and and the 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 majority of the players were the new cubans yes they they were hispanic players right but in some cases, uh, I always say that those players had two strikes. They were black and they couldn't speak the language properly. So some of them, some of them they did, but some others they didn't. So I don't know how it had to be really bad. I, I'm told that, that Coimbra used to speak English, uh, but uh, it had to be difficult at the time. Right, yeah, that's the thing about like Mini Minoso. He broke <laughs> color barriers and language barriers. That you know, I I will never take anything away from Jackie Robinson, but it was a different experience that Mini mm -hmm. Minoso had as well. Yep, I agree. Yeah. I agree. So, what can we do to to promote Pancho Coimbre and many of the other players that we've mentioned here as well? Like, how can we raise their profiles? Well, I think that on, on, on my behalf, I need to finish the English edition of, of the Going Better book, right? That will be probably the first step on my on my part. Uh, I uh, sometimes I like to uh, to write articles that will bring back uh, historical figures. For example, uh, last year I did uh, an article about Otani but was bringing the uh, Martin Diego figure, right? For the younger generations, you know who he is, or he knows, but maybe Johnny, who was 19, he had no freaking idea who Martin Diego was, right? So uh, Martin Diego, for example, he used to pitch, but he also used to play second base. He would play all over. <laughs> the only thing he wouldn't play was, ca was catcher. Yep. And he used to perform incredibly, right? Otani, I don't say anything away. He's like a, a Martian, right? He is able to pitch and he's able to hit, but doing it doing the DH, he's not doing it in the field, right? But these guys used to do it. So, so my plan, our plan, and I'm just saying our plan, Jorge, right? I speak to her pretty much every other day, not to say every day, is just to continue writing more in English. Uh, so the Baranas, the Tetelos. Mm -hmm. uh, all those guys are, are better known uh, for the baseball emphasis, right? Uh, and, and that's what I would say, right? It, it's Yes, it's important to, to know about or to remember Satchel. It's important to remember Josh. But there's so many stories that are hidden or forgiven uh, in time that it's our it's, – I don't want to say our duty, but it's our passion. Because of our passion, uh, we need to bring them into from the obscurity for people to learn. That that reminds me, uh, uh, 
Sean Foreman, my uh, boss over at Baseball Reference, he's giving a talk this week about the the Negro Leagues project. And one of his slides that I was looking at said, you know, we didn't do this project for the Satchel Pages and Josh Gibsons. I mean, it was certainly part for them, but they already have this profile that that people are aware of them. We did it for you know the players who didn't have that profile and to to allow more people to learn about them whether that's Pancho, whether that's, you know, mm -hmm. anybody else that's that's played in the Negro Leagues as well. And I think we can actually go beyond that. And, you know, I'm talking to Jorge about how could, we could possibly get uh, some more stats from from the Puerto Rican League as well. And that would be amazing uh, for people to see as well. Adam, when, when is that conference? Uh, that is a, a talk at a school he's giving this week. Oh, so okay. it's, it's like a live talk. Yeah, it's not oh, a, a broadcast one. Maybe maybe we can bring him over here to our program to talk with him, talk with him with, you know, speak with him to see if he's interested. I would love to have Sham here with us. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, I'll bring that up for sure. Okay. So uh anything else, uh Raul, that you want to tell us about Pancho and uh well uh you know what there, there's not enough time, right? We don't mm -hmm. have enough time to, to keep talking about uh I, I think we have made clear how important he was for for puerto rico in baseball yes. how important he, he he was for uh caribbean baseball right uh there's so many stories of him being a scout uh and as a, as a teacher as a as a manager but the the important thing is like people have heard his name today again and uh people will watch this uh podcast in a month and they say oh Pancho Coimbre uh who the hell he was was he <laughs> so so maybe the word Pancho right Coimbre they will allow them to learn more about the Tedelo Vargas's the Perucho Cepeda's and all these players that they they play an important part of baseball that unfortunately there was not someone pushing their names uh when all this uh Negro League momentum happened in the in the 90s right uh it, it's understandably that satchel and josh got all the fame because they were the best players right but at the, at the same time these 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 players they were great a lot of them decided to stay in latin america because they were being paid better than going to the states they didn't have an issue with the language playing in venezuela playing puerto rico playing in dominican republic and they were treated better. They didn't have the problem with the race. So again, you know what, what you guys are doing, it, it, it's it's wonderful. I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to come and talk a little bit about, about Pancho and about all these legends that uh, made the game better. Sure. Well, I really appreciate you uh, sharing uh, your expertise on Pancho with me. So wrap it up, Adam. All right. Well, thank you all for, for watching. We had uh, a, a few good comments come in as well. So thank you to everyone who is watching live and, and uh, sending encouragement. And uh, we will catch you next time on uh, Negro Leaguers in Puerto Rico.